welcome to the series of talks on relationships. We pray that these sessions will establish a healthy foundation from which you can pursue God-centered relationships. What does a girl want in her dream guy? In this session, Yaneta helps the guys out by highlighting what a godly girl is looking for while reminding the girls what they should be looking for. Just before Yaneta comes up to speak, I'm going to ask Tanya to come and share a little bit. And you'll see she's got this very big glowing thing on her left-hand side, which to many of us in this context is a significant sign of success. So, Tanya. Thanks, Phil. I would just like to start off with the joke, but it's not actually a joke. Um, if, you were, if you live a worldly life, you'll get a worldly husband. But if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd just like to just share with you guys just the amazing stuff God's been doing in my life. And how he's just been carrying me and how I actually don't deserve any of it. And yeah, it's just by his grace. Um, my, sto- my story starts off in 2006. Um, I had a boyfriend back then in high school. And um, yeah, like I didn't have a relationship with God. It was, yeah, I didn't have solid foundation. I basically, you know, it was easy for me to... Um, you know, sacrifice my values because, you know, there was nothing keeping them together. So, yeah, we started pushing in the boundaries and eventually we started sleeping together. And, um, yeah, that was obviously tough for me because I felt, like, really guilty all the time. And, um, yeah, so I came to varsity and in my first year I got saved. And, yeah, I remember the night that I got saved that God was really telling me, like, I have to get out of the relationship. And, um, you yeah, know, that night I spoke to my boyfriend and I told him, you yeah, know, I gave my life to the Lord and, you yeah, know, we can't sleep together anymore. And he was like, okay. And, you yeah, know, so it was really hard to share with him stuff, like, about God and, like, about salvation and the Holy Spirit and baptism because he just, he wasn't interested in God. And um, so, yeah, it was difficult, and I know God wanted me to get out of the relationship, but something in my head kept telling me that because I was, I screwed up and I had sex before marriage, that I didn't deserve anything better. So, yeah, I stayed in the relationship, and I just prayed, and I said, Lord, yeah, I started praying for my husband, and I was like, please, Lord, let him be equally yoked, let him be a godly man, let him lead me and yeah and that was just nothing in the boyfriend I had then and yeah like I started in the end of our relationship I started praying that God must just get me out of the relationship because in my own power I can't do it so basically for two years I was still in the relationship and we weren't sleeping together but we were pretty much doing everything else and um, yeah so finally in the beginning of 2009 like I found out that he was cheating on me for at least two years and it was really tough for me because I gave my body and I gave my soul and I gave my whole heart to this guy. And, yeah, he didn't, that didn't satisfy him enough. And um, so, yeah, I got out of the relationship, praise God. But it was tough. And for a long time, I believed that, you know, love is fake and that guys are just after one thing. And they don't care about girls. And yeah, and all these lies that the devil just kept pumping into my head. And for a long time, I would just joke and I say, I'm going to be single for the rest of my life. I'm going to join a convent. Because <laughs> um, no guy is ever going to want me. No godly man's ever going to want me after I screwed up. And I really wanted children. Still do. And I just, <laughs> I think. For a long time, I just thought I'd just get married to get children. And, yeah, I had this warped sense of love that it was really, like, very temporary. Like, you're in love for a month, and then it's over, and then it just sucks. And, yeah, it was, 
was dark times. Um, but then in 2010, um, oh yeah, just before I share that, like through it all, God kept giving me promises about my husband one day. And like small things, and he would say things like, he's going to be romantic and he's going to be handsome and I'm going to be physically attracted to him and he's going to be attracted to me and he's going to be a godly man and we're going to be equally yoked and he's going to lead me just in being a better Christian, having more relationship with God. And I was hearing these things, but I didn't really believe it because the devil's lies just seemed more plausible than God's promises. And, um, yeah, so I was on this journey with God about love. And I was like, God, teach me. I don't get it. So in 2010, we were preparing for for um, an outreach, a missions trip. And I was sitting in my room, and I was just kind of praying in the Spirit and stuff. And, you know, God just showed me this picture of me coming to the throne room. And it's like judgment day. And underneath his throne, he pulled out the book and it had my name on. And it was an accounting ledger. And like the good things I did was in green. And the red things I did was like the bad stuff. And I was so indebted. Like I couldn't even, you know, the whole book was pretty much red. And God just took the book and he threw it away into hell. And he said, that's where your sins belong. But the day you gave your life to Jesus, like, I gave you a new book. And he, like, gave me a new book with, like, clean pages. And then it was like I went back to earth and I came back to heaven. And, you know, God took out the book again. And he was like, and I thought, oh, crap, I really screwed up since I've been saved. Um, it's going to be all red again. So, you know, he opened the book. And it wasn't an accounting ledger. It was a storybook. And he just showed me like the stories of my life and the stuff that where I was obedient and where he was really proud of me. And he was like reading the stories to me. And he was like, remember that day? Like I was so proud of you. You got it right. And I was just like, how does this work, God? Like your grace. And yeah, I just clicked for the first time that God is love. And that, yeah, like I remember like asking God, why, Lord, why? Where's all the bad stuff I did? And he was just like, but Jesus' blood covered it. I didn't see it. And, yeah, so I started clicking what love is through God. And, you know, I really believe that the scripture is too, that we can love because God loves us first. And, yeah, so the end-ish of 2010, I met my fiancé. And <laughs> and it's so awesome. Like while we were still dating, like all God's promises came true in him and through him. And none of the devil's lies panned out. And he's the most romantic, handsome guy that I know. And he always just encourages me to just have a better relationship with God. And, I mean, he drove all the way from Johannesburg just to sit with me while I give my tennis testimony tonight. And, like, how does that even work? And God is just awesome. God is faithful. And he's true. And he's good. He's so good. And, yeah, I just want to give glory to God because I'm nothing like the person I used to be. And the only change... It was from my side. It was the day that I accepted the Lord into my life. And the rest was all God. He did the changing. And you know, glory to him. Amen. Hello. I just want to say before I start, I'm really hungry. <laughs> I was so nervous at home that I couldn't eat. And I'm sitting there thinking, why didn't I eat? Now I'm here and I'm hungry. Um, but anyway, my name is Janetta Bosov. I am Philip's wife, and that is our daughter, Lisa. Um, yeah. <laughs> Proud father. 
Tonight we'll be talking about what a girl wants, and I hope that my words won't fail me as we go. I am nervous. I've, every single day I talk to teenagers. I've got a class full of teenagers before me, and I thought they would be more threatening than you guys. And you're a little bit more threatening. <laughs> so please forgive me. Okay, just before we start, I would like us to pray. Father, I, I pray that you would bless my words tonight, and I pray that you would send your spirit to work in each and every heart tonight, to hear what you want each and every person here to hear tonight, Lord, that they would, they would be not condemned, but, Lord, convicted of things that they need to look out for and things that they need to know of. Thank you, Lord, that your grace is so amazing in relationships, and I pray that that would come through tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so tonight we're talking about what a girl wants. Um, and this is a, it was a weird topic to put together because I can't come here tonight and give you a blueprint and tell you that if you are going to be this man, then you are going to be the perfect husband. Or girls, if you go for this man, this sound is funny. It feels like it goes away and comes. Okay. Um, if you go for this man, then this is the man you should go for. These are the blueprint things that you need to go for. Um, everybody has different things they like, different... Um, interests, and that will definitely make be part of the kind of guy you're going for. But hopefully as we go tonight, you'll find some biblical truths that are non-negotiables, things that really men should try to be and women should really look out for. Okay, um, before I go on, I would like to give a little bit of an intro, just before that's a little romantic picture, setting the mood for what girls want. <laughs> okay, the next slide. <laughs> I just told Philip a foot should have popped, you know, like in the movies, a foot should have popped. Um, okay, so before we start, I would like to, as an intro, just say three things that I've learned as a girl, waiting. The first thing that I really want you girls to hear is that waiting or being single is not wrong. If you're single, you are not in the wrong place. Every season, like... Um, um, Anton spoke last night, has a different purpose, and we need to see that those purposes should be embraced, okay? It's not being married or being in a relationship is not this perfect place where I should be. Once I get there, my life is going to start. Once I find my husband, my life is going to start. That shouldn't be your goal, okay? There's definitely blessing, and there's a lot of beautiful things when you are in the right relationship that wouldn't be there when you're single, but there's also things that you won't be able to do anymore. Very simply, I used to be a dancer, but nobody here knows it because that was 10 years ago. When I, when, as, as growing up and as work and life happens, those things can't be anymore. So I can't dance anymore. Now that I have a daughter, I've got a completely different set of life. I can't um, go on missions anymore. There's certain things that my season currently does not allow. So where you are now, embrace it. Otherwise, you're going to miss the things that God has for you. That's the first one. The second one I want to say is, it links with that, embrace the season and know that you don't want to miss the things that God has in store for you today. And then the last one is, don't go into a relationship expecting to be fixed or to fix the man. Don't date a bad boy hoping that your love is going to change him. And don't go into a relationship thinking that I have a low self-esteem, but if somebody loves me or if somebody cares for me, if somebody tells me I'm beautiful, then everything is going to be okay. I'm speaking very plainly now, but often we believe this thing. I used to believe that, that if I go into a relationship, then because... I now get affirmation from this guy, I'm going to be okay. That's not a reason to be in a relationship. God fixes you. If he needs a counselor or he needs fixing, send him to a psychiatrist. You're not the psychiatrist, okay? Yeah, that's not why you're in a relationship. So those are just three things I really wanted to throw out there before we start. Okay, if we're talking about what women, what girls want, we need to talk about what are girls. Okay, the first picture I've got there is just stuff. Girls like stuff, okay? High heels, makeup, we know we like thingies. The next one, all girls want to be a princess. We all grow up dreaming of our knight in shining armor, coming to rescue us. Life sometimes fades that out and we don't remember it that well, but I can almost guarantee you that every girl here at some stage wore some kind of fairy dress or princess dress running around imagining my hero is going to come and save me. Um, so that's the first thing I really want to lay on, that girls want a hero. <laughs> They want a man, okay? They don't want a, another girlfriend because then they will go talk to their girlfriends or I told Philip, 
they can get a Labrador, okay? <laughs> they can just get somebody that loves them, okay? Um, the next one I've got up there is chocolate. Just wait in case, you know, girls like chocolate, okay? There is a relationship between us and chocolate that you should never forget. Okay, the next one. Um, girls want to be adored. We want to be told how beautiful we are. We want to be told we are lovely. There's like a little hole somewhere in us that never gets full of compliments. You can keep giving us compliments all the time. We like them. We like hearing we're beautiful. We like hearing we, you like us. We like, we like hearing compliments. Okay. We want to be cared for, and we want to be told how gorgeous we are. And then we want romance. Um, girls really enjoy romance. Often girls fall in love with the idea of romance and not the guy. And here I just want to put a warning sign that if you're in a relationship because you want the romantic thing, you want to sit at the fireplace with a blanket and hot chocolate and talk your heart out because this guy is going to have the patience to listen to you talking the whole night. That's not realistic. <laughs> okay. Don't fall in love with the idea of romance. Romance is definitely part of a relationship, and as you get married, that's something that is really in-depth discussed at marriage prep. Romance is important for a girl, but we grow up with the idea of romance. The other one I've got up there is gentle. This is a tricky one that I want to try and explain. Um, I believe, and maybe you might disagree with me, but I believe all girls are gentle at heart. Life is hard at us. A few years ago, I wouldn't be the one standing here telling you that, that girls are gentle because I was very feministic and I was very on my own mind. Philip and I married when we were 28 years old. At that stage, I have been independent for a very long time. I have managed my finances very well. I have traveled the world and I felt that I can do this. I can do whatever. But being in the relationship and allowing myself to be gentle and to let Philip be the man really brings a dimension in a relationship that we don't understand, and it, unless you actually experience it like that. Girls are gentle at heart. They want the hero. They want somebody who looks out for them, who, yeah, you're not pathetic, girls, if the guy opens the door for you or pulls out a chair. You're not a pathetic person. Let them be men and let yourself be gentle. Okay, so that's the one thing I wanted to say. And the other one is we talk. We talk and we talk. Make peace with that, guys. We talk. Okay. <laughs> And then, okay, let's get on to the serious business. Um, if we talk about what girls want, the first place I started is, um, as I said, I work with teenagers. And they often come and ask me, teacher, what kind of boyfriend should I want? What kind of guy should I be looking for? They're not saved. It's a completely different story if you tell, talk to those girls who most of them have been in plenty of sexual relationships and they have no frame of reference of church. Um, but some of the stuff I got here is stuff that I got from their conversations because I hear how they think about relationships. Some of the things I got from the movies, from songs, from popular culture. Yeah? So what is it the world says a girl wants? First thing? Um, oh, did I think mix something? No, no. That's fine. Um, oh, I didn't tell you about the fruit salad. Go back to the smoothie quickly. I have to say this. This is important, people. This is seriously important. Girls make smoothies and guys make fruit salad. I put that up there with the emotional because sometimes I would start crying about something silly and I tell Philip this happened. And then as we talk, I'm not just telling him a problem. I'm painting him a picture of things and things connected to things and there's other things that were somehow involved here. It's a whole painting of stuff. And I tell Philip in the beginning when we were married, I told him, Philip, my problems are a smoothie. I don't know what they are. They all get mixed up. You look at problems and you see a fruit salad. You can take this kiwi, you can take the, the peach, you can take and you can sort them out because you can see them. If I look at my problems, they've become a smoothie. I need to get the fruit back. <laughs> what I want to say here is that girls work a little bit differently emotionally. If you're in a relationship, don't expect your boyfriend to come and sort out your smoothie. God does that. He's the one that comes and shows you direction in your smoothie. If you get married, your, your husband will be your friend, and he will talk to you about that. But mostly, it is still God who comes and sorts out your smoothie. Okay, so learn to do that in prayer. Okay, next one. Oh. Yes, girls like flowers. <laughs> right. So let's talk about what the world says. 
the world says that if I go into a relationship, I've sort of touched on this already, then I will be fixed or I will fix my, my man. Um, lots of the girls at school will tell me, but I like this guy so much. I love him. Why can't I be with him? And then simple reason is he's messing around with other girls. He doesn't love you. But, but he loves, I love him. I want to stay with him. Your love is not going to change him. Okay, girls, we all want fairy tales in a sense. If a relationship doesn't start out as your fairy tale, chances are it's not going to become your fairy tale. Okay, don't settle for something that's not where you want it to be. And we'll be talking about those things a bit later. Um, don't expect to fix a guy. Your love is not going to fix him. There's a saying that says, girls marry and hope their husbands don't change. And men marry and hope their wives... Yeah, otherwise... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> girls marry and they hope their husbands change. And guys marry and they hope they have, well, their wives don't change, but we do. Okay. Marry the guy or like the guy. Start dating him. See his characteristics. Because if the relationship is going further, you have to like him as he is. You're not going to fix him along the line. All right. Other one that you see a lot in the movies is he will make me happy. He's going to complete me. That's, that's not a realistic expectation of the man or of the relationship. God is the one that heals you. God is the one that completes you. The relationship is just an outflow of what has already happened on the inside. If you go into the relationship with a little bit of a hole and you're expecting this man or this boy to fill your hole, it's not going to happen. That little heart hole needs to be filled with God. Philip spoke about um, the sermon he said about two halves don't make a hole. I would really, if, if this is something that you think, oh, that sounds interesting, get that sermon and listen to it. Um, the other one that you really get in the world is that I can go in and out of relationships as I please. I'm in this relationship, now you're not making me happy, so I want somebody new. Okay. <laughs> they jump in and out of relationships with no real respect for the weight that comes together with, with, with relationships. If you do that, you are collecting unnecessary baggage. You don't need to do that. Like I said, you don't need to be in a relationship for the sake of a relationship. You don't need to test if the relationship will work or learn things. Another thing is you don't need to go into a relationship to see if you're sexually compatible because I've heard that one also. Every man and every woman is sexually compatible. There is no funny thing about that. When you get married, you grow in that field. Okay, so you don't date somebody to see if he kisses well because I can't marry somebody who doesn't kiss well. <laughs> Very simple thing, but I've heard people say that. Um, so people are very casual about dating, and they're often in and out of, of relationships, also one-night stands, without understanding the full emotional package that comes with a relationship. Another thing girls say in the world is they want a material man. They want a manly man. They want a guy that will provide for my financial expectations. I want stuff. I want a house, I want rings, and you should have the money to provide me. That is not a biblical point to look at a man or the expectation of a relationship at all. Okay. Um, yeah, and with that together, I also want to say the macho man. Um, I don't know if this is so much here, but I just want to put it out there. At school, the girls will come to me and say, no, they like this guy because he's cool. He can handle his drink. He... Um, <laughs> I know they're teenagers, but often we have a very strange idea of what a macho man, what a manly man is. And they want this guy that he gets, you know, if this guy says something bad towards me, then my boyfriend must come and protect me. You know, he must jump in there and I want to sort it. You know, they, they, <laughs> they, they have a very strange expectation, and that is not. Reason if you love, I know. <laughs> um, they have a very very wrong expectation of what a manly man is. And we'll get to that later, okay? Girls often drop their standards and they drop their dreams because they think that, like Tanya was sharing, that it's not real. That I must settle for this guy because what if there's nothing else? Um, I, I, I have a comfort area around me, so I'm just going to be in this comfort area. God wants us to have what he wants us to have. Don't settle for anything else. If you are not in the relationship with the peace that he wants you to be in that relationship, then you should not be in that relationship. Okay. Um, and the other thing that I've put up there is the sexual games. We know that the world um, expectations of relationships is maybe, I'll tell you that story later, but you go on a date and then 
it's, it's, he's going to think wrong of me if I don't want to have sex with him on the first night or whatever. One of the girls have told me, and she's older, um, she's told me that if she refuses a guy, then he will tell her, you don't love me, and then leave her. And she can't stand the humiliation, so she'd rather just have sex with him. Um, I hope as I'm talking, you understand that that's not a biblical principle. Um, and that he's not, I, I, tell her off, I tell her often because we seem to have this conversation a lot, that he doesn't love you. If that's the kind of expectation he wants of you, then he doesn't love you. Okay. Because if you tell him to wait and he respects you, then it shows love. Okay. And then don't settle. That one I've got already. I think I've already said, don't settle for a guy that's not what you feel God has for you. Now here I just want to say that remember the guy that you're going to marry is going to link with your calling and you are going to link with his calling. Now that's often something we don't understand initially, but being married and going into that into that sphere of life is not just having a house, having a car and having children. It's God's calling on your life and God's calling on his life becoming one. So choosing a husband is more than just choosing him for these things. Okay. Then let's look at what the word says. What is the biblical standard for for guys or for a relationship? If you if you think of where you're going or if you think if I want to I want to build, build a house. So in order to build my house, I need to have a plan. I need to know where I'm going. And there I say setting your goal. If from the start tonight or whenever, you decide that I am setting my goal to be a biblical good marriage. That's my goal. Then that will direct your dating. Dating, courtship, whatever you want to call it. It will direct your getting to know people to choose if that person is going to be your partner. So what is a biblical marriage? That we know from Ephesians 5, it talks a lot about Christ and his church, how the relationship of marriage is like Christ and his church. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit now. But the three things that I really want to highlight here when we talk about a biblical husband is just those three that I've got up there. In marriage prep, this is really discussed in detail. So I'm not going to do marriage prep now. That's not the idea. But I want to just give you an idea of what to look for if you're looking for this godly husband or to be if you are a man. Um, a man should be a husband, should be a prophet, a priest, and a king. Now, what does that mean? A, what is a prophet? A prophet is the person who goes to God, gets direction, and then carries the direction for the family, the vision. God works through the husband to set the direction for the family. Now, uh, hopefully as you hear this, it would be difficult to do that if you're not married to a man who knows God. God's idea for a family is that the husband should be the prophet. Um, and then together with that is the priest. What does a priest do? A priest leads his people to know God better. And in a sense, that is what a husband does. A husband is not responsible for his wife's spiritual growth. But a husband definitely has an influence in it. He prays for the family. He directs his family. And he also has a vision from God where to go spiritually. So that is what a priest means. And a king, if you think of a king, you think of a hero. Think of, of King David, King Arthur, whatever. Think of a king in cartoons. A king is the hero. He's the provider. He's the protector. A king is the one that, 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 that gives to his, to his people and he looks after them. The husband should do that. He should be the one to look after the family. Okay, so I just want to add there, a boyfriend is not a husband. So you can't be in a relationship and now expect your boyfriend or even your fiancé to just be these things. These things come when you're married. It's when the covenant comes. It's when God says, now you look after your wife and you're becoming one. Then these things fall into place. You can't expect your boyfriend to be your prophet or your priest or your king, but you can see what character he's made of. Does he have this? How is his relationship with God? Does he have, is he a prophet in his own life? Is he a king in his own life? Is he a priest in his own life? Because that will filter through to our life, and that's what you want to know. Okay, the next one is, um, now this is really scriptures. I've got a lot of scriptures up there. And the reason for this is, when I was thinking through this, there's no blueprint in the Bible that says, husband, chapter one, <laughs> wife, chapter two, whatever. But there's lots of things in the word that tells us what we should be. God has a standard for us. 
Now, often when we're in relationships, we forget these things. So we're going to read stuff that you know, but we forget that this man or this guy that I am dating or that I'm whatever, I want to know, does he have these, quali these qualities? Because these are the qualities I want in my husband. Now, the first one that I would actually say there's no compromise because the Bible says you cannot be unequally yoked is that he must love God. He must be serving Christ. And just to get practical about that, think of a family. You're raising your children. You're married to a guy who doesn't know God. You want your children to be raised according to biblical standards and biblical principles. I have a friend who was in a relationship like this, and eventually they, had to, they got divorced. She felt God saying, you can't divorce this man, because he developed, we'll see as we go, he developed an incredible love for money. And with that, he developed, oh, there were prostitutes in that house. They had incredible parties where men would walk around naked. And in that, she had to raise her children. And she wanted to raise her children with, with knowing God. But that environment was just so hard that she had to pray and literally take her children away when there's a party because she doesn't want to expose them to naked men walking around in the house. Um, but that's not an extreme thing. Just think about disciplining your children. If you have a biblical way that you want to discipline your children and your husband does not, and you are the wife, and we'll talk about submission a little bit as well and respect. But the tricky thing about being in a, in a marriage is because, because God sets high standards on the man to be the ruler of the house, in a sense. Okay, now I have to choose my words well, because this can sound very funny. Um, let me just say it like this. In the word, God has two commands for, wife, for wife, husband and wife in Ephesians. The one is he says to the wife, he commands the wife to respect her husband. And the other one is he commands the husband to love the wife. Now, I've figured this out for myself, that if we go on default as women, um, we often, being very independent, and you know, today you can work for yourself, you can care after yourself, you can do whatever, it's not your first instinct to just respect your husband. You might throw opinions of him, back chat him, do things that you do naturally because people do it. But biblically, God does not want that of a wife. He wants you to respect your husband, not because of what he does, because he wants you, he commands you to respect your husband. At the same time, men are very focused at careers. We are wired differently. Men go for the chase. They go for the hunt. They, they build their kingdoms. That's what guys do. Girls don't do that so much. Sometimes they do, but get, men are built that way. Now, if you are focused on that, then stopping and you know, now I've got to love my wife. My wife has an emotional need. It's hard for a man to just focus. So these are two things that, in a sense, is a sacrifice for both parties because they need to learn that that's what the other one wants. The wife wants love. The man wants respect. Okay. Now, that is something you can practice on your friends already, is to start respecting your, your, your male friends and for guys to start loving, in a, spirit, in a Christian way, your girlfriends, you know, your friends who are female. Okay, now where was I going with that? Because it wasn't on my notes. Um, God wants us not to be unequally yoked. If you think now that is the background of what I want for a, for a, for a, for a Christian marriage, and now I'm married to a guy who's not saved, it's hard for the wife now to submit to God because she knows she must respect her husband, but her husband is drunk every night. Her husband comes home and swears at her. She must submit to him in that sense that she must respect him, but he's not giving her the behavior to. So in a, in a sense, I want to challenge the guys. It's not really a challenge, but be the kind of man who a wife will respect in your behavior. And as we go through this, you will see what kind of things are they. All right, Philip will get into detail about the female side of things tomorrow, about the other side, but that's the thing that I really want to um, put on a highlighter for tonight. So let's look at yeah, just two Corinthians up there. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For fellowship does uh, for what fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? And what partnership does light have with darkness? Now, as I say, think about this verse in terms of where your marriage will be if you're not married to an, a believer. Okay. Next one is love. Now, here I actually want to just say, we all know this verse very well. And Mason said it on Sunday in church. I want to put, just re rephrase it a little bit. Your husband or your boyfriend or the man you want to marry should be patient, kind. He should not be envious. He should not be vain. Not be puffed up. Not behave indecently. Not seek his own. 
Do not be easily provoked. Think no evil. Love does not, so he should not rejoice in unrighteousness, but he should rejoice in the truth. Quietly covers all things, believes all things. Okay, now, as I say, these are things we should actually all be. But think about them in terms of the man's character that you want when you get married. The next one I've got up there is security. Women want security. We live in an age today where women are very independent and it's fine. We can work, we can have our own cars, our own houses. You can be independent. Um, and I think relationships have sometimes an interesting dynamic. For instance, when people are married, if the, if the wife is a financial advisor, then she might do the finances. And the, the husband likes cooking, so he'll cook. So there's no like rules, né? you know. But security is something that comes from the husband. Why? Because at some stage, wife is going to be mother. She's going to be wife. And as I said earlier, even though there are girls who might not agree with me now, at that stage, you realize that you are very gentle and that you are very fragile. And you need the security of the husband that he gives. Okay, now security can be a lot of things. It's emotional security, knowing that you can trust this man for who he is. It's also financial security. But this is something I really want to highlight. Everybody who is married will testify to the following. That, for instance, in a marriage, if the woman chooses to stop working because she has a baby, and they both um, have the faith, then God will provide through the husband. Because that is the hierarchy that he wants. He wants to provide for the husband if the wife is only the wife. So that security comes through the husband. And I think, in a sense, guys just need to know that God wants to make you that. Um, it's not something that you have to maybe try and be. You just have to have the faith to be there that God is going to do it through you. It's a promise. Okay, the other thing that I just want to link there, why, where does this come from? The story of Ruth. We know that Naomi had two daughters and they married her. No, no, Naomi had two sons and the two girls married the sons. And, they, they, and then the sons died. And then Naomi decided she's going to move back to her country. And Ruth decided she's going to come with Naomi, the other daughter. Um, what, what do you call a daughter in English? Daughter-in-law. They, she stayed behind, but Ruth decided to come with Naomi. And when they're in this new land, she was picking up. Ruth was on the fields one day picking up the wheat or barley or whatever from on the field of Boaz. And, and then she went to Naomi, and Naomi said that this man will give you security. So, they, so she told her how to go to him to, in the right manner so that this man will marry her to give her the security. So it's a biblical thing. But as I say, I know we're living in a different time, so women can fend for themselves. And there's a lot of single mothers who do it very well. Um, but it's not, it's not the perfect idea that God has for a marriage. There's more blessing and more grace in the idea that God has for the marriage. And security, like I say, comes from the man. Okay, the next one, fruit of the Spirit. Now, this, to me, is something very obvious in a sense. Yet sometimes we don't think of it. If a person is filled with the Spirit, they will have these fruits, but we all grow in them. Sometimes we struggle, whatever, so you know the guy's character. Whether this is part of his character, you know, you're not going to be religious about it. He must always be like this because we all make mistakes there. But these are things that will show you where his heart is. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering is patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Against such things there are no law. Okay, and then the flip side of that is what, what should you really not be looking for? Adultery, fornication. Does everybody know what fornication means? Do I get a no or a yes? Give me a, give me a head move. <laughs> a yes or a no? Do you know what it means? Okay, fornication is um, sex outside of marriage, uncleanliness, lustfulness, idolatry, sorcery. And sorcery in today's terms, I really want to actually put in the... Um, Sorcery can also be things like astrology and stuff like that. I'm not going to get into detail, but sorcery, hatreds, fighting, jealousies, angers, rivalries, divisions, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness. Okay, so these are, those are things that really does not testify of a godly life. Okay, the next, things I've, the, the next thing I have up there is um, humble. Look for a guy who is humble. Look for a guy who can admit when he makes a mistake. This is hard for guys. Because they want to be, they want to be in good standing, you know. And um, part of the woman respecting the husband 
is knowing that you want to respect him when he makes a mistake. You're not going to rub his nose in it. That's part of the respect. But there is definitely a place where a guy must be humble, show you that he's just a person. Okay, look for that. Um, not a love for money. And there I want to put on a really, that's really a, I wanted to put a different scripture on, but I thought everybody knows that one, so I put up this one. For men will be self-lovers, money lovers, boasters, proud, blasphemy, blasphemers, I don't know how to say that, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, unyielding, false accusers, without self-control, savage, despisers of good, traitors, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. Turn away from these. Um, Often we look at guys and we think, oh, it's okay that he's drunk every Saturday. He's a good guy. Um, don't be misled by those things. Okay, I'm not trying to make law about this, but know that these, be, this behavior is not behavior that God wants from us. And there's reasons why he doesn't want this behavior from us. He wants us to impact our world. He wants us to stand out so that we can impact his, our world. He wants to, his purposes on earth to become alive through us. Okay, and then it's, it's important for us to know that he has a reason why these things should not be in us. Okay, then from Ephesians 5, I got lots of stuff. Um, I was reading through this one, I thought, oh, I should have just, I should have just spoke about Ephesians 5, that um, you should be a follower of Christ. Sorry, of Christ. Walk in love, we spoke about love, no uncleanliness, doing things that is acceptable to the Lord, filled with the Spirit. Words of truth. Now, I put words specifically up there because one of the things that really tends to happen in relationships and in marriages is verbal abuse. And the reason why I put this up here is know your husband, know this guy's words, know his language. Be, let it be words of truth, of life, speaking hope, speaking beautiful things, building you up. Let it be words of thanks, not of boasting. Okay, so know the, the verbal culture of this guy's of this guy's life. Okay, what is he saying? Um, walking in the light, is he hiding stuff? Is there stuff that, you know, that he is not sharing or that you know of but other people don't? No fornication, submitting to one another. And here, I think I've put it up somewhere else. But here, I really want to say submitting to authority. Um, teenage girls at my school think it's really cool if a guy's a rebel. Now, rebels often don't change. If you can't, sometimes they do... Thank you. But if they, if they can't submit to the authority in their life, then how are they going to submit to God? Okay. Uh, uh, submitting to your authority, if you work, like we, women, we often, in a marriage, I submit to my husband. Me. If, I, if he's at work, he submits to his boss. A man still needs to be able to submit to authority in his life. That shows you a lot of character. It's a strong man. I say that to my kids at school. It's a brave man who knows that it's okay to submit to his authority. Okay. Knowing the will of the Lord, and then a husband will love his wife like Christ loved the church. He will love his wife like his own body. And we know that Christ loved the church to the extent where he gave his life for the church, which is a tall order to ask for a man. Okay, but Philip will be looking at the other side for a woman, I hope. <laughs> okay, so in short, let's just say, what does a girl want? We want to be loved. Now, this is a sentence that you are going to learn, take a lifetime to understand. <laughs> what does love mean to the girl you are pursuing, to your wife one day? What does love mean? Okay. Um, I just put some things up there that, I th that popped up. Love to me is kindness when you don't understand my emotions and patience. <laughs> Caring when I need it and when you'd rather watch TV. Patience when I need to find the fruit in my smoothie. Quality time, because you're my best friend. And security, because I can focus on just being a girl. Yeah, I wanted to change that. I didn't. I wanted to say security, because those things are part of being a woman at, at a certain season in your life. Okay. And I want the security to know that if it's my season, then I can do that. You know, you're going to allow me the freedom to do that. And then romance, because I'm your princess. Okay. So, last sentence, girls want their hero. Okay, like I said, otherwise they would go have coffee with their friends. They want their hero. They want a man who loves them. Okay, that's the end of all I wanted to say. 
are there any comments or, or <laughs> things that you want to add or ask? <laughs> okay, so if there's nothing, does nobody else want to say something? Okay, does, did you guys learn something? Did this make sense? Okay, you're welcome to come and talk to either of us. If I said something that really doesn't make sense, oh, yeah, I put that one up there because when I look at them, I see, I need a hero. <laughs> okay, and for Shrek, they are each other's heroes. You know, they, they, they match, so they're beautiful. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you that we can come together and, and laugh about these things, Lord, that, that relationships are beautiful and that is your will, Lord, for us to find the perfect one that you have for us, that we can step in the future and in the, in the calling that you have for us with our partner one day, Lord. I pray that you would bless each and every individual going from here tonight and that what was said would grow in their spirits to a place where the things that they need to know and the things that they need to apply would become reality. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Anita. Were there no questions for her? You can just say it really loudly and we'll try and hear from in front. <laughs> okay, the question, the question is, there's girls who like the rebels, they don't really like them. I think, I think they do. Um, from personal experience, this is just my testimony a little bit, is I used to go with all the rebels, <laughs> all of them, because I liked the danger part. I thought that that was a man, that is brave um, for me. But in, in, in looking back, being in the position, the places, and the, the, the what do I want to say, but the places that I was dating those rebels, because they were off the track completely. Um, it's not in God's will. Looking back at that, I know that they, being in love with that rebel or thinking I like that rebel was completely for the wrong reasons. But at the same time, I'm not going to say that girls don't like you. I mean, your makeup is lots of different things. Each one of us have certain things that we like, certain music, certain places that we like. And you can, in a sense, uh, oh, this is going to sound funny, but I think you can still be sort of like a rebel, but submitting to God. Um, but not, uh, I want to say, so being a rebel towards authority, all kinds of authority is not biblical. Um, but that spirit doesn't have to die. You just have to learn that the rebel spirit, in a sense, you know, but I'm, I, I don't know how to say this. I work with a lot of rebel kids at school, and they have so much potential. They have so much potential in each one of them. They just need to learn to challenge that energy into the right place. And then they will walk into incredible futures that they can. But they're challenging it into an incredible rejection of authority, which is not godly. Okay. So, yeah, what I want to say is, I really think. A girl should ask herself why she's going for the rebel um, and not expect to change him and not expect that there's some kind of thing that he's going to give her that she needs to complete herself or whatever. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Uh, I just wanted to know, what do you do when, when you meet someone and, and you realize that they, they, they're in love with you or they think they're in love with you because of how you look or what they can see? Okay, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, they will like you because of the way you look. <laughs> the part, of, the part of, of, of falling in love with somebody is not falling in love with this paper person. You fall in love with a person. Often the first thing you notice is, oh, he's gorgeous, he makes my knees go wobble. That's often the first thing you see, and that's often the thing that pulls people together to start to get to know each other. But then from there, I would just say to always have that getting to know each other as friends, you know, because you need to see the inside. You need to know the character. You need to know what is this person more than just the musician on stage that makes my knees go, whoa. you know. You need to know the person. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're asking if you're in a marriage, does the love in the marriage have expectations? Okay, that's a marriage prep thing. <laughs> There's a DVD that, um, that's really, really cool about um, expectations and desires, but it's also that gets discussed at marriage prep. Um, love should be unconditional, like we've read it. Love 
like God loves us. If you go into a, if you're in a relationship and you start having expectations of that person, then you are putting things on that person which is not that person to f- to fulfill. Okay, desires is a thing that you have. Maybe you have. I have a desire. I like this, but it's mine. Once I start making it a requisite, like I, I expect flowers today. Then it's an expectation. <laughs> then it's an expectation that I'm putting on him, which is unfair. It's not unconditional. So I would say that expectations are definitely something that you need to work out with God, because the other person should not be sorting out your expectations. Okay, any other questions? No. No, no. Pursuit of business success is not the love of money. (laughs) She's asking, is the pursuit of business success the love of money? No. Men are, in a sense wired to try to to go for a business they want to build their careers and that's fine that's how god made them the the problem comes when money becomes the most important thing when you start making money your god and when it starts directing everything um there's really a goal i just want to say this out but there's um in our bible school we talk about stewardship stewardship is financial stewardship to know money comes from god and you need to steward it because it belongs to him God does not want us, um, God is not scared of making us rich. Okay, that's not, money is not evil in that. But God gives us the money to do his purpose. Otherwise, I'm rapping to you guys. Okay. <laughs> Unintentional rapping. Okay. So the problem comes when money becomes your God, when money becomes the thing that is directing all your decisions and you are actually placing money before God. It's a hard thing. It's not a career thing in that sense. Okay. I don't think there's a perfect woman in that sense that your personality must be this way. Okay. Um, but God knows what match to give you. I really want to say that because, um, like I say, we were 28 when, I, when we got married. And I have been very independent. And I was always one who would, if somebody has an opinion, I would tell you you are wrong. And I don't agree with you. I was very opinionated always. I still am a little bit. Um, but when I took Philip home to meet my parents, my father told me afterwards that when he saw us talking, he knew I was going to marry him, just because of the way that that I communicated with him. Knowing him and the person who he is made me want to be the woman in the relationship, if that makes sense, because I feel that he knows things that, that challenge me. You know, he's, he's somebody that if he says something, I listen. And um, God knew what match to give me. Okay, but at the same time, there is a place where you need to learn about, but I don't want to, make this is a big topic now for marriage prep, but there is a place where a woman needs to learn to let the man be a man. And um, the thing that I want to say is, women can do, you can be very independent, and that's beautiful in a sense, but the beauty in the relationship is when, because you are, you are this independent person. You choose to let your man be the man. Um, that's a submit. That's a that's a willful thing. He's not going to punch you or verbal abuse you into the place that you must now be the wife. You choose to love him and to respect him and to let him be the man. Okay, so that's not a change in your personality. It's a love thing. Thank you for listening to this talk. We trust that you have been inspired to glorify God in your relationships. For more information, contact us on 012-362-1363 or pretoria at shofaronline.org. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Shofar Pretoria. God bless. We may silence them, but we will trust in